Now I'm going to review the Cyclotic Islands culture. It was a circle of islands near uh, mainland Greece, just between what's currently Greece and Turkey. And uh, you can see it there highlighted in purple. Much of the art found there were pieces found in tombs. And again, there are these uh, female idols for the most part. Uh, the piece in the center there is almost five feet tall. Uh, many of these pieces were made with limestone. I now compare the Venus of Willendorf on the left with uh, one of the Cyclotic idols, and you can see the similarities. Again, they were created close to the same time, um, but the tools and materials were slightly different. They were using bronze tools now in the Cyclotic island era. What we know of the Minoan culture is mostly derived from the excavations on Crete and the other Cyclotic islands, plus the Greek playwrights and the writer Homer, who created epic poems about the trials and travails of early Greeks exploring the Aegean Sea. This record of Greek history was mythologized by Homer, giving godlike attributes to the rulers, warriors, and beasts encountered in these poems. Homer may have been inspired by the oral traditions of storytelling, and in writing them down, perhaps he did not embellish as much as record these stories. Inspired by this record, Arthur Evans, a British archaeologist, was able to locate Canassus and other Minoan cities beginning in 1900 on the island of Crete. The Minoan culture produced art that was less heroic than the Near East, but more natural and design-driven using patterns and whimsical animal renderings. Some scholars believe this was due to their less warlike society. Curvilinear forms dominate their fresco paintings and pottery. This work seemed unencumbered by the constraints of Egyptian and other Near East dogma. A similarity was bull imagery. It appears bulls were revered and may have played a religious role connected to the bull jumping ritual depicted in various Minoan artworks. Also, images of women were more pronounced in sculpture and paintings, and may be a tribute to the mother goddess concepts of the Bronze Age and perhaps a more relaxed, less patriarchal society. We see once again, similar to Mesopotamia and Egypt, that women are lighter in color and men are portrayed darker in color. One interesting note was that the bulls used for bull jumping were thought to be a very large breed derived from a wild bull that is now extinct. Once observed by the early Greeks, it was the basis for the Minotaur myth written about by Homer. The Minoans fell victim to the invading Mycenaeans. This invasion may have occurred due to the weakening of the island people caused by a gigantic volcanic eruption. This may have led to a gigantic earthquake and a tidal wave. There's a possible historical corroboration of the event described on an Egyptian stella, the Tempest Stella, that mentioned a terrific storm and flood. Ultimately, the Minoans fell to the Lycian culture. The Minoans had built a fairly large empire where seafaring people and trade it widely. The Mycenaean culture, located by Heinrich Schleiermann in 1870, the Mycenaean culture originated on the Greek mainland and later expanded their empire, invading the Minoans and Cyclotic Islands, plus Mycenae was to have invaded Troy. Again, the Greek mythological writings mention this and other tales. This group is more warlike and expansionist and appears to have created a wide empire throughout the Aegean region. Their structures, were fortified unlike the Minoans, yet their paintings were again more curvilinear and graceful. This is the Lion Gate of Mycenae. Its colossal stones were said by the later Greeks to have been set in place by the Cyclops, and therefore we call this Cyclopean masonry. These were fortified cities whose palaces were known as megaroms. This detail of the lions also includes a depiction of a Minoan-style column. This column shows the Minoan influence on Mycenaean culture, a column that mimicked the human form with a wider top that tapered to the base. Again, the lions that never sleep are carried over into Greece as well. The Minoans and the Mycenaeans were excellent metal workers. This Mycenaean bronze dagger is inlaid with gold. This death mask is a striking example of their craft, called the Mask of Agamemnon, though there is no evidence it was his. It does display the beginnings of more naturalistic rendering that the later Greeks carried forward. After the fall of the Mycenaeans, Greece and the Aegean region, so named because of the Aegean Sea to the east of modern mainland Greece, experienced a period of relative obscurity. 
Two distinct groups of Greeks evolved, the Ionians of the East Mainland and Aegean Islands, and the Dorians of the West. Collectively, they referred to themselves as Hellenes and Greece as Hellas. They developed a language and writing that is remarkably similar to modern Greek and led to the alphabet that we use in the West today. Out of this perhaps chaotic time, the Hellenes created city-states that initially challenged one another for territory and power in the region. Ultimately, the unification of Greece occurred due to the threat of the advancing Persian Empire. The city-states rallied together to repel and ultimately defeat the Persians. This led to greater influence in the region and allowed the Greeks to colonize parts of the Mediterranean basin. The Greeks began to think of themselves as the center of civilization and strove to be progressive in all things, including self-government, that did not include kings or pharaohs. The independent city-states were the beginning of democratic government and a more human-centered approach to all things. This basic belief that an individual had self-worth and a role as a politically active citizen allowed the arts and science to flourish. The might of reason had triumphed the might of tyranny. It was during this time that the poets and playwrights that inspired the great archaeological finds of the 20th century created those works. And during this time, due to the emphasis on the individual, the visual art advanced faster than at any previous time. Freedom of artistic expression was fostered and encouraged by this progressive thinking. Further, artists became known, admired, and respected. They pursued perfection and based their ideas on human form and scale. Their work advanced from stylized and geometric to natural and organic. They attempted and succeeded at creating works of realism and ultimately personality that celebrated the human figure and the world it inhabited. On the left is an example of the geometric style. On the right, the orientalizing style. The detail allows us to see the geometric shapes and stylized schematic figures on this amphora. This crater shows the influences from the Minoans, with the figures stylized, but also the beginnings of our natural form with the muscles emphasized. An archaic period black figure amphora is the beginning of a specialized firing process that creates the black and red of this vessel, as well as this crater. The detail of this piece further shows the red lines created by scratching through the black areas before firing. Continuing experimentation led to the red figure style in the classical period. Notice also the development of more realistic drawing including foreshortening and foreground and background development. This white Lykitos was yet another innovation that included firing and painting after firing to achieve this effect. Late classical pieces became more refined and elegant. These last two pieces are from the Hellenistic period and are made of glass. So yet another material that the Greeks used with some of their later art. This bronze sculpture parallels a geometric period with the stylization of the mare in full. It is very classic in its abstraction form. The statue from Crete begins to soften the figure, and the detail shows a geometric patterning of her skirt. This koros displays Egyptian influences, the left foot forward, hands to the side with the clenched fist, and even the hair mimicking the headdress of a pharaoh's sculpture. And of course, one of the most distinguishing differences, it is of a youth and not a pharaoh or a king. It also has space between the arms and body, and it begins to feel more animated. The stele from a grave still exhibits the frontal eye position, but the face is certainly less rigid than earlier work. This Corre, a maiden, was sculpted by Arestian and a chorus, a male youth, once stood as grave markers. The hair is still stylized, but we see an advancement of form and looser, more natural pose overall. The Critias boy, so named for the sculpture Critias. Critias boy was a breakthrough, being one of the first examples of contrapposto. The torso is shifted and right hip and shoulder lowered, creating a slight S-curve. The body looks relaxed and natural. Though the hair remains stylized, the face is also more natural. Bronze sculptures were also being created in greater numbers and in size as well. This sculpture of Poseidon using the lost wax technique allowed the sculpture 
to break free of the marble block, and in a short span of time, the Greek sculptors were creating lifelike images. The late classical era saw Polyclitus create a more organic, less rigid form as seen in his Storiferous sculpture. Originally cast in bronze, it was greatly admired by the Romans who made this copy. The hair no longer seems like a hat, but lays and curves on the head, and there's a greater twist to the body with the head tilted slightly, emphasizing the contrapposto of the figure. Hellenistic period works included greater personality as seen in this piece of Titan Anitos, sculpted by Domophon, for a temple setting. So we can see that in a span of 400 years, Greek art advanced more quickly than at any previous time. And over the course of only 200, they pushed ahead to create some of the most natural works ever created. Their society of free thinkers and democratic ideals fostered a great civilization and lasting impression on the world.